Okay, this is an end game that I really want to comment a while ago. It's one of the end games uh, in the that comes in the great book of Jacob Agard about technical end games, about technique. Mastery on, on technique or something like that is the name of the book. <laughs> Actually, I did not see the book in a while, but I remember this end game comes there. I see it a while ago and it really impressed me because I think it's one of the best explanations that I ever saw about uh, one of the basic principles of technique in the end game and that is schematic thinking. Okay, and what is schematic thinking? Well, more or less is the search for a setup, a setup uh, where pieces are in the best possible uh, positions. Okay, it's not exactly a plan, because in a plan uh, you will have to to follow certain steps. No, like I will do this, then I will do that. Schematic thinking is more like okay, I want my pieces to be on this position. And in order to achieve that, we are not that worried about the time that, that will take or the steps that we will have to follow. It's mostly about visualization of the position where we want our pieces to be. And to explain that, Jakob Agar uses this position. And, and what he shows us is a wonderful uh, explanation of how to do this. And of course, Henry Danielson, the player with white, actually does a pretty impressive, impressive job at winning this game. This is not an easy position to win because first of, of all, even if black is a piece down, this pawn is really powerful. And if I try to to get that pawn, like bringing my king towards it and then capturing it with the knight, the resulting endgame uh, could be a draw because uh, my h pawn probably I will have to sacrifice to to keep my bishop taking care of the f pawn and the h pawn probably won't be able to be hold. So black basically will have big chances of getting a draw here if white is not careful. So before trying to do anything here, white decides to improve his position, put his pieces in the best setup, and he found the next position on his mind. We can we can assume it is is this one. Okay? Look at this. This is the target that white is looking for. This is our target position where the knight cuts down the black king from coming and creating counterplay against me my H pawn. And the bishop stops the pawn and also look at how the bishop is acting from the distance and the knight is actually closer to the area of the main operations. So why decide that if he achieves this position that will be his best setup and will give him the best chance to win the end game. And something important to remember about the end games and especially these kind of end games. Like here black has no real counterplay. Uh, okay? At least in the setup that we are getting. So white could play for a long time without having to be worried about the dead draw. He can just try to poke here and there to see if his position can be improved. So we don't need to make sure that we are winning this kind of engines. And actually, I think that is the ground setup, the ground, uh, sorry, the ground mindset. Uh, our mindset has to be more kind of like the cat and the mouse where we have to play with the with our food we have to play with the enemy and the longer the game goes the bad the better because the chances that our opponent is going to make make a mistake because uh how tired he's going to be on how difficult to defend this position uh, is is going to result to him so look at how we are going to look in our mind to try to get the great setup in this case danielson thinks this is the best one and he will play uh, he will make the next moves trying to reach that position, okay? So let's see what happened in the game. Let's go back. So after after black took an fight, that was his last move. After black took white played bishop f4. Good move. Extra control over c1 and actually also cutting the activity of the black king. 
king h4, king h2. Uh, do we need to be worried about tactics on these kind of positions or not at all? We need to, but it's not as in, in the middle game. We, when we have to really be focused mainly on tactics and calculation, here we only have to make sure that we are not doing like anything terrible. And our, our other goal is always to look for the opponent's counterplay. Try to stop any counterplay that he can have, if possible. Anyway, let's keep going. Bishop d5, knight d3. Now the knight is free to move, and we are going to try to bring it to f4. If this was white's turn, he probably will move the bishop to c1, and you know what is coming next, no? Uh, the knight to f4, probably. Okay, bishop c4, knight d1. I am attacking the pawn. So bishop b3, and now I can kick out the king of h4. And more or less, once I pull back the king, now I'm going to be able to reroute my pieces. Bishop to c1, as we said, and knight to f4. So actually, I think I say something wrong here. Like if white plays, I say that he would like to play bishop c1 and knight f4. No, because I need to move first that king that is creating a blockade. So white's next move uh, seems to be knight a1. So he has to play bishop b3 and then I make that check. In case of black playing here bishop e4, I still can play knight e1. Because if he moves the king towards, if he moves the bishop, he loses the pawn. And then the resulting endgame with the f pawn should be a victory for white. Not a super easy one, but it should be a victory. Most probably I will be able to take the, the f pawn with my knight and my king and kicking even back even more the king, the black's king. And the bishop with the h pawn promoting in dark square is a victory. If it was a dark, a white square, it would be a draw. The bishop needs to be in control of the corner if I have an h pawn. Anyway, here it will be similar to the game. Here, here. Um, more or less black is on subs one. If he comes with the king and tries to keep my my knight out of the game, I can just progress. He will have to give room to my king, and I don't think he can hold this because the bishop is not playing. So eventually, he will have to actually probably sacrifice the c pound to to get out of the suits when moving to his own bishop. Because if not, I will just push push the pawn, and I will either promote the pawn, or he will be in subs anyway. So, yeah, to keep the bishop on e4 is not a solution. Anyway, in the game, follow bishop c4, knight e1, as I said before. And now we are ready for the next step. Okay, we need to get the knight to f4. Knight d4 is a really good move because I am going to be able to go to e2 eventually or to e6 and I am hitting the pawn right now. So bishop e4, bishop c1, bishop d3. As we know, black doesn't want to go back with the king. And now we go to f4. And check. And um, h4, and we got the desired position. So this is the position that we were looking for. And now, once again, comes the schematic thinking on this position. White was able to kick back the king. His pieces are are in really good positions. Black has no counterplay whatsoever against the H pawn, but to win here will be really difficult still. 
anyway, White found a way to to win the game, almost by force, starting here, using schematic thinking. Not always that is possible, but here, I could have found a way to do it. So, I think you should stop the clock here, the video here. <laughs> think about, about, I will tell you, 15 minutes could be a good time, no more than that for sure, 7 to 15 minutes, and try to find the way that White used to win this game. Okay, so please stop the video now and start looking uh, 7 to 15 minutes this position. What will I do? And let's go. Are you back? Well, if you are back, I hope you found the wonderful idea that uh, Danielson, Henrik Danielson found here. He played, he realized that, okay, my knight is in the best position, my bishop too, and of course I have to try to activate my king. I could do that without seeing the whole idea, but I'm pretty sure he found the whole plan. And his plan is to bring the king all the way to h8. Okay? Once the king is there, I'm going to be able to play bishop b2 and keep check. It's just a beautiful idea. And more or less, black is forced to do that. Because, remember, if black loses one of the pounds, most probably he is losing the, the game. So, it's going to be hard for him uh, not to allow the white king to go there. And if he comes with the king, like trying to meet the white's king, uh, the h pound could just promote with the help of the knight and the bishop in the distance. So let's see what happened in the game. Bishop b2. This is good technique, by the way. Couldn't the king uh, getting any chance of activity, uh, making any chance of activity harder? Bishop a6, king f2, bishop b7, and we go with our plan. Just one thing. What happens if black goes with the bishop to e4? And tries to... One second. Yeah. And tries to meet our king. Like this. Victory here could be harder, but I don't think it would be impossible. We will have to look. Sadly, and uh, Jacob Agar doesn't comment on this. I don't think to push the pound will be great here. Definitely, it doesn't feel like that would be the best plan. It's a position that certainly deserves a little bit more of analysis. I still will try to activate my king. This is hard. What about this one? King is 7, King is 6. This seems like progress. He has to play again, okay? The bishop cannot move, the king has to move. To move to h6 allows to do the plan that we have in mind. So let's say king here, king f6. And I think this is gonna happen anyway. He is counting a subsequent. Here, and now the king cannot activate, so I can bring my knight to help. 
here. Uh, yeah, here I'm going to promote a Gip checkmate. I don't think he can stop me from giving him checkmate. Or promoting. Too many pieces. Yeah, this seems like a good plan. And this is one of the things that uh, here I'm gonna win. Like, what does he play? Let's say he just stays, just f to show this. Here, check. If you go here, I just play pawn of seven. If you go here, this is gonna be checkmate. Check. Either way, I win. Check. Check. Mate. <laughs> okay. Yeah, what happens on this position is that it's something typical of these situations. Black is going to be in subs one over and over. Like, I just have to give him the move, and his position is like the best defensive position, so he has to move. And then he moves, he is losing. But what about this one? I guess, same thing, no? Here, here he cannot attack my pawn. My bishop is going to protect him from the distance. He will have to stop it, and then uh, gaining, winning all the same. Same ideas. And yes, he can give this pawn, but then the end game is totally loss for him because I just will come with my king take the pound and just just to show this in case you don't have it clear there are other ways to win here but this is just a really easy victory if the pound wasn't white the square the is the corner was white and the bishop is the bishop of dark squares this would be a draw even with the extra bishop but here we just win easily either we get the queen or we get checkmate anyway go back let's go back so i was just trying to show what happens if black tries to go with the king to stop my king but uh, he didn't do that he just allowed my king to to do all the trip down to h8 and guess what? We got our position and the checkmate is coming with bishop g7. Black can do nothing about it. I just find this is an amazing game. An amazing example of schematic thinking. I really hope you enjoy this. Schematic thinking is a really big part of the uh, game technique. Also, just remember, it's a big part, but it's uh, really useful in this kind of end games where there is not a lot of tactics things are more or less settled uh, there are tactical end games where we actually need to calculate and even this end game not this end game but many end games where we can use get our way playing a schematic thinking sometimes will tend to become more tactical as our advantage uh, gets bigger and bigger and at a certain point we will need to calculate but that doesn't mean that we should not learn how to use this this tool in this particular endgame, something that I want you to realize is that for white, one of the reasons that it's so hard, more or less, if you see the whole thing, obviously it's easy, but it's not that easy to find it. But the point is that there is only one weak uh, weakness for black, and it's the H pound. Usually in the endgame, you need two weak spots. Here, fortunately, uh, my pieces are strong enough to, to get the the queen or the checkmate but the fact that there is only one weakness for black even with the extra piece make it really hard uh, if you think about it an ending with an extra piece even if it's profound should be usually an easy thing and here that is the main difficulty that white had uh, other things that you can rescue from this end game uh, things that i talk in the classes that i usually do, uh, give to my students are the principle of do not hurry white has no hurry whatsoever to finish the game right now i mentioned this in this video already like you should 
enjoy if the game is going to be long. Uh, of course, if you have a forced victory, you should try to go for it, unless it's too complicated and you don't have it that clear. But if you see an easy victory, you should go for it. Uh, I guess that's it, like the, in this end game at least. The schematic thinking, the principle of the two weak spots, of the weakness, uh, the do not hurry principle. And, and well, that's it. I, one more thing, like how do we learn this? Because it's not that natural if you think about it. Like, oh yes, Mauricio, I have to use the schematic thinking, but so what? I, it, for me, that is like uh, rocket science. I mean, I don't know how to get there. What should I do? Just because you tell me I should do it, it doesn't mean that I'm gonna be able to do it. Well, that is why we study games like this, and especially the classical games have a lot of end games where you can see more or less what 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 the side with the advantage is trying to do and if you really pay attention to what they are doing the players with the advantage you're going to be able to teach your brain to develop that intuition to find the best places to put your pieces and of course you should try to when you analyze your games to try you should try to figure out if you could in certain moments use this uh, is this only a thing of the end game Mostly, but even some middle games have that chance, like really calm middle, ga middle games where there is not a lot of counterplay for the opponent. We can do that. Petrosian, for example, was the uh, Carpo were the ultimate masters on this on this kind of technique. They were insanely strong in that regard uh, of where to put your pieces so they are in the best places. But well, these videos may be longer than I already wanted it to be, but I hope it's really clear. About this issue and I hope you have a better idea about how this works and how to study it moving forward so basically studying masters games and trying to to find by yourself how should we put the pieces and then compare with what they did okay that's all for now I'll see you around and have a really wonderful day bye bye